Hello again and welcome to Dr. Pundit. I'm Michael Douglas where we talk about music, not medicine. And on this edition of the show and podcast, I'll be talking about my latest obsession. That's right, obsession. It has to do with a Netflix special chronicling the recording of one of the biggest charity singles of all time. I'm talking about We Are The World. And the name of the Netflix documentary, which premieres this month, February 2024, is The Greatest Night in Pop taken from how one of the biggest participants, Lionel Richie, described the event. I've watched it and it's a treat. At that time, I was a junior in high school, so I remember it very well. It was a single that was launched to provide famine relief in Africa, and it was so much more than that. You hear the song today and it still resonates. The goodwill through the song still resonates as much as it did almost 40 years ago when this song was recorded without any pretense, without any political obfuscation. It was just a great moment in the history of pop music. And I wanna share 10 moments from that special right here on this edition of the show and podcast. Again, I'm obsessed with it right now. I've seen the video twice. Probably won't watch it again for a few months if it's still on Netflix, but it's it's very watchable, very, very rich. And if somebody is watching it and has never experienced it or doesn't recall it or was too young, they definitely will get benefit from watching this particular documentary on Netflix. In 1985, dozens of singers pulled an all-nighter in California while recording a charity single for famine relief in the country of Ethiopia or as Lionel Richie puts it, the greatest night in pop. Netflix's nostalgia trip documentary about the making of We Are The World, the greatest artists of a generation came together with all of their egos, with all of their talent to save some lives. The giant music collaboration produced by Quincy Jones and written by Lionel Richie and Michael Jackson was still, believe it or not, being written some 10 days before it was actually sung that night after the American Music Awards. But the schedules of artists like Bruce Springsteen, Diana Ross, Stevie Wonder, Harry Belafonte, Bette Midler, Tina Turner, Billy Joel, and many more were only in brief alignment due to the American Music Awards, which happened and concluded just before they recorded the track. And there was a little time to make a lot of history. So here are some of those stories, tend to be exact, behind the scenes that are somewhat humorous, but it all puts it together. And I, again, it's an obsession. So here's the first story. Michael Jackson's menagerie interrupted the songwriting process. Of course, that's not hard to understand given his propensity to having exotic animals. When Lionel Richie came over to Michael Jackson's house to work on the song, and this was well before they sang it that night, Lionel Richie declined an invitation to hold Bubbles, of course, that infamous chimpanzee that Michael Jackson owned. At one point, he was startled by a loud fight downstairs between a talking bird and a dog, but then Lionel Richie turned to see the, quote, biggest frickin' snake, unquote, he had ever seen. Jackson was excited because his pet had apparently been lost in the room, but I guess Lionel Richie found it. Lionel Richie went on to say that Michael said, well, he came out when he heard her singing and he just wanted to say hello to you. Well, Lionel Richie was too busy screaming and he went on to say, Lionel Richie, I've seen this horror movie and it doesn't end well for the brother, meaning I guess the black guy, Richie recalls. Number two, Waylon Jennings walked out. Of course, he's the big country star who is no longer with us. At one point in the mid recording of the track that night, Stevie Wonder wanted somebody to sing some of the lyrics in Swahili, but this late night suggestion was just too much for Waylon Jennings, again, a country star. A cameraman recalls hearing Jennings say something to the effect of, well, ain't no good old boy ever sung Swahili, I think I'm out of here. And as he was heading, for the door, Stevie Wonder was later informed that Ethiopians don't speak Swahili, and Bob Geldof, also a personality, talked Waylon Jennings out of the idea, so he stayed, thank goodness. Number three, the blind led the blind. Now, during a week between takes, Ray Charles told Stevie Wonder that he needed to go to the bathroom. Stevie Wonder grabbed Charles by the arm to guide him there. This prompted the rest of the room to crack up and a quip about the blind leading the blind. 
It wasn't the first Vision-related joke of the night, however. Earlier, during an impromptu Deo cover, a tribute to Harry Belafonte, Stevie Wonder scored big laughs when he swapped out some lyrics to sing about being driven home by me or Ray, quote unquote. Number four, Dinah Ross and her fangirl take. And at one point during the night, Dinah Ross walked up to Daryl Hall and declared that she was, quote, his biggest fan. Of course, one half of Daryl Hall and John Oates. She asked him to sign her sheet music and suddenly, Everyone was walking around asking everybody else for signatures, you know, as if they were holding yearbooks and just asking people to sign it. Number five, Sheila E. felt that she was only invited to get to Prince. Okay, Sheila E., a very famous Prince protege. She had a couple of singles that were big hits in the early to mid 80s. Prince's collaborator and on and off girlfriend, Sheila E., did call him during the recording process telling him that everyone was having a great time. Prince actually did phone Lionel Richie and told him over the phone that he would do a guitar solo in a separate room. But while Sheila E. was waiting for her turn to sing a verse, she grew disillusioned by the fact that she kept getting asked about Prince, suspecting that they were keeping her there because they really wanted Prince to be part of the collaboration in the studio that night. She said, I already knew he wasn't gonna come because there was too many people and he would feel uncomfortable. And I told Lionel, I just said, I'm gonna go. She later reflected, they never intended on having me sing a verse, which was a little bit disconcerting and heartbreaking. That's pretty interesting. I never would have thought that. And that's a little sad as well. Now, number six, Cyndi Lauper's microphone mystery solved. Now, everybody is familiar with Cyndi Lauper singing the wow, 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 but <laughs> I don't think this has much to do with it. Lauper almost didn't even show up. She told Lionel Richie backstage at the American Music Awards that her boyfriend at the time didn't think that We Are The World would be a hit. And once recording started, her mic kept picking up a weird background noise that sounded like people chattering. Cindy Lauper would go on to say to everybody, well, I don't think it's funny and you should stop laughing when I'm singing. As she recalled saying, only for Quincy Jones to then realize that the cause was all the jewelry she had on. She later said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm loaded, and rushed to start removing the necklaces and the bracelets she had. There goes the whole outfit, she said. Number seven, Huey Lewis overcame a bit of the imposter syndrome. Huey Lewis in the news, one of the biggest bands in the 1980s. Huey Lewis was asked to sing the part that was originally written for Prince. And he recalls being, quote, nervous out of my brain about filling Prince's shoes. And with so many singers he had respected around him, you know, he was also anxious when he was asked on the spot to be part of a three-part harmony that hadn't been in the demo of the track. But with a little time and a little patience and a lot of humor, quote, I just sang it out of tune just to see if anybody would notice, unquote, he made it through. Number eight, Lionel Richie had to keep Al Jarreau away from the alcohol. I didn't know that Al Jarreau drank a lot. I don't think he was an alcoholic, but that's pretty interesting. And according to Richie, Jarreau kept calling for more wine because he wanted to celebrate before the song was finished. Looks like he wanted an excuse to drink more wine. Richie smoothly intercepted bottles and removed them from the room, but he suggests that enough damage was already done. Said Lionel Richie, we had to work very hard to get Al's part on before Al couldn't remember what his part was. Pretty interesting there, I guess. Of course, Al Jarreau no longer with us. Number nine, Bob Dylan needed help from a Bob Dylan impression. And for most of the recording session, Dylan seemed overwhelmed by the crowd. If you watch the video, you can see his eyes darting awkwardly from side to side multiple times. And when it was his turn to sing alone, his voice came out pretty weak, but he finally started grinning, uh, especially after Stevie Wonder impersonated him and sang his part. Now, ultimately, Dylan was able to deliver his lyrics much more effectively and confidently and loudly once the pack room was cleared and he could sing with Wonder at the piano and with Quincy Jones at the podium. That's something else I didn't know, but you know, when you go back and watch the video, it really makes sense. And for the last and final story, this pretty much sums it up. Diana Ross was the last to leave. 
One of the vocal arrangers recalls hearing her crying after the other artists had left, and for a sweet reason. Quincy said, Diana, are you okay? And she said, I don't want this to be over. And I think that sums it up. It's a little bit hard to see this happening today with all the politicization of the issues surrounding charity singles for whatever cause, and that's unfortunate. We Are the World represented a time in which getting together, helping out any way you can, using the talents that you had, really went a long way. Audiences realized it, record buyers realized it, radio realized it, and the whole world realized it, that, as I said before, all these stars got together after the American Music Awards that night, checked their egos at the door, sang their hearts out for a good cause. And it all culminated in We Are The World, a number one song from 1985 and one of the biggest charity singles ever. And a song that basically beget another attempt at it 25 years later when We Are The World 25, Superstars For Haiti, got together and recorded a similar track, of course, by that time, a lot of the magic really wasn't there. It certainly was for a good cause, but that January night in 1985 was very, very special and for good reason. And I think you should check it out if you haven't. It's on Netflix. The name of it is called The Greatest Night in Pop. And I would roughly agree with that. And I think you'll come away with a lot of the feelings that I had after watching it twice. So there you have it, another one of my latest obsessions, this one for the Netflix documentary, The Greatest Night in Pop. I'm Michael Douglas, and if you like what you see here on the channel, please don't hesitate to like, subscribe, and comment. I really appreciate it, and it allows me to keep giving you these musical commentaries, and I hope you enjoy them as much as I like producing them. And until next time, as the late, great Barry White used to say, let the music play, and I'll see you on the next video.